it and perhaps pass the squeeze all virtually through Zoom. And maybe we'll even sing the wishy washer, washer woman. Um, all right, without further ado, let's start with our Ask a Naturalist. Let's see, what do we've got? We've got lots of great questions tonight. And we have a new feature in our Ask a Naturalist. We have spent a lot of time since March answering questions, but tonight we're gonna turn the tables. So here's our first turn of the table. This is a good, this is, this is our first slide. It says, one of the first things I wanted to see in New Hampshire is a moose. I know this is rare. I don't expect it to happen too soon, but I did run into this foot for scale. Is this moose poop? So this is a question. Is it moose poop? Take a look at it because you're going to get to name that scat and you get to vote. And Miles, why don't you tell us how people can vote um, on whose scat it is? Moose, porcupine, bear, jackalope, or other? Yeah, so jackalope. <laughs> the different options and you can go ahead and vote. So you could just click on it? Just click on it. And actually, I can see people voting now. The voting is happening now. Um, when we've got a, quite a race here. This is very exciting. Jackalope is actually surprisingly getting quite a few votes. <laughs> oh, this is, people are liking this feature. All so, right. looks like we're uh, finishing up here. OK, Miles, would you like to, to share? Okay, it looks like Moose won, and that is actually 100% correct. As the princess of poop um, in this group, um, that is indeed Moose poop. That is in the photograph of the slide. Very good, poll. That's very good. Good job, everybody. Um, I just want to take a moment and say one thing about this scat. Um, what this scat is showing is actually probably Moose's winter scat. Um, see, it's sort of pelletized, and it looks... Um, I'm sure if we kind of cracked it open, um, it would be kind of grainy and woody inside. This time of the year, if you found fresh moose scat, it wouldn't look so pelleted. It would look more like a cow patty because they're eating a lot of greenery. They're eating all those green plants, um, standing in the water, eating a lot of aquatic plants, um, and their scat will reflect that extra addition of um, kind of succulent green growth. So. This is old scat, but still it is moose scat. Good job, everybody. Give a thumbs up. All right, let's see what our next question is. Oh, beautiful, look at this. I had a firefly in a darkened room last week and boy, was it bright. How bright is a firefly's light? Don't know how you can quantify it. So I'm gonna turn this question over to Jenna and see what you have discovered. Jenna, as our entomologist, what, what can you tell us? Okay, so I had to do some research on this because that's a really fabulous question. So what I found out is that the glowing patch on an adult firefly is about a millimeter squared and it's flat. So if you were to like, it seems like when you see a firefly that it's sort of like its whole tip of its abdomen, but it's really actually a flat patch. So somebody quantified this, it was not me. Um, and it was a fire, an average firefly emits about six times 10 to the negative four lumens, which is compared to a 100 watt bulb, it's a 100 watt bulb would have about 1600 lumens. So you would need about three times 10 to the 31st flock fireflies to emit the same amount of light as the sun and about 750,000 fireflies to emit the same amount as a 100 watt bulb. That's a lot of fireflies. A lot of fireflies, but there was this other really interesting fact is that per pound, so if you actually weigh the amount that's lighting up in the firefly, which is that very like several cells thick millimeter squared, and you compare that to the sun, it turns out fireflies are brighter than the sun per pound. Oh my gosh, that's so that's crazy, cool. right? Yeah. So then, Another just fun fact about fireflies, for those of you guys, you probably know this, but I just had to say it, is that fireflies emit a cold light um, because biologically they couldn't emit heat with their light because that wouldn't work for their bodies. So it is a cold light, so it is very different than the sun in that regard. So wow. just that. That's really cool. I also did, I've been doing a little, I'm obsessed with fireflies. And recently I wrote an article for the ledger about fireflies. So I got really into it. And one thing I found out is that 
the light they produce is incredibly efficient. It's 99% efficient. So there's no waste when fireflies make their light. And, um, and I was also surprised to learn that the light of the firefly is used as a way to detect bad food gone bad. Since the 1960s, the chemical reaction in the fireflies is used to see if food has salmonella in it. So they actually would collect fireflies back in the 60s. Now they make it um, kind of through uh, synthetic and they can use it. And if, if um, the food reacts to it, it means it's bad. So fireflies, very useful and nice research, Jenna. Good job. All right, oh, here, what does it mean by it? no light is wasted. So it all goes into emitting light. It all comes out as light. There's no heat loss. That's what that so, would be. Yeah, the comparison that I read today was that, you know, an incandescent bulb gets hot and it's not as efficient as the newer light bulbs that don't emit as much heat. So it's like a firefly is even more efficient than any light bulb we have because it's a completely cold heat because it's so efficient. There's nothing lost at all to heat. It was fascinating. Who knows, maybe we'll have synthetic firefly fly light in the future. Pretty cool. All right, let's see what's next. Miles, I got, oh, wow. This is really cool. Jenna, I already no, noticed something about this. Any idea on this type of dung beetle? Observed beetle actively moving scat, but not sure exactly. What was it going to do with the scat? Jenna, what's up with the dung beetle? Well, first, what did you notice about the photo? Well, I noticed it's in sort of sand. Oh, yeah. So what, this is a rainbow scarab beetle, which is a type of dung beetle. I've never seen one in New Hampshire, so I'm super envious of Pam, who apparently took this picture. So that's awesome. Um, the, this is a female. The male isn't quite as bright, and he has this uh, strange sort of horn on his head. But this female is moving the scat around, and she is going to lay her eggs kind of under it. And then the eggs will hatch out and the larvae will feed on the scat as they develop. So they'll actually tunnel through the scat. This is some large scat. I don't know what it is, Susie, you could tell us. But- um, yeah. Okay, good question about the scat. It's, yeah, but these are native to this area. This scat is definitely in the canine family and it's hard to tell whether it's um, a wild canine. My guess is it's looking a little bit like dog scat because there's not a lot of, there's a lot of uniformity to it. It sort of looks like somebody ate a whole bunch of dog food and there's a little bit of hair maybe, but not a huge amount. I, I, it's hard to determine. I will say it, to me, it, it looks a lot like a canine scat. And um, Jenna, do, do, um, does this beetle have a preference to carnivore versus herbivore scat or will any scat do? Well, it was interesting because I was reading and it said they particularly like porcupine scat. So that's definitely herbivore. Um, but then it also said sometimes it'll, they'll just go for what they go for. Because yeah. beetles, beetles of this type don't travel very far. They're not efficient flyers. And um, so sometimes they just have to take what they can get. Wow, how about that? What a way to start your life in a pile of crap. <laughs> okay, all right, let's move on. Let's see, what do we got? Oh, this is good. This sound was coming from a thickly forested area adjacent to our front yard and appeared to be coming from at least 10 or more feet up in the tree. I think I got within 10 to 15 yards of the source before it went quiet. So we're gonna listen to it. Wow, that was really interesting. I have to admit that this um, this audio caused some conversation within the Harris Center of what could that be? And I think people had different theories, but I'm gonna go to Phil. Phil, what do you what do you want to say about this? Well, this oh, is on. first of all, it is a bird. Oh, oh, wait, go ahead, oh, wait. Is this a pole? Yes. Oh, crutters. <laughs> Okay, people, this is one of our polls. I forgot, sorry, I got so used to our normal way of doing things. All right, we're gonna take a poll. You get to guess. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, that's the wrong, that's the wrong poll. <laughs> this is not the sound that scat makes. Hold on. 
But it might be the sound of a jackalope. We don't know. It could be. Uh, all right, we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Okay, we're going on. Let's see what's going to happen here. Hope I didn't give too much away by referring it to our friend Phil over there. Oh, I think I gave it away too. <laughs> well, I don't know. Okay, what? Is, oh, this is good. What is making that sound? Barred owl, caterpillars eating, turkey, or cuckoo? Other. Can you play the sound again? Hard to hear. It's very faint. It's like a coo, 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 coo. <laughs> I like that. This is getting very exciting. Can you hear that? Yeah. Lots of votes for Bard Owl. Yeah, we're getting. Should we end the polling there? I think we'll end the polling there. So it looks like Bard Owl is the winner with Turkey next, followed by Cuckoo, Caterpillars Eating, and Other. So let's see. Um, Phil, would you like to tell us what is that? Sure. Well, at least most people did guess a bird, so that's good to see. But it was the last of the three options in votes that is the winner. This is the sound of a cuckoo, which is otherwise known as a rain crow which is a, an interesting nickname for the family of cuckoos, which tends to get more vocal just before it rains. So if anybody is around where I live right now, maybe we'll be hearing cuckoos any minute as the skies are darkening and I'm hearing some distant thunder. Um, but there are two species of cuckoos that live in our area. And first of all, what is a cuckoo? A cuckoo is a bird that's about a foot long, so a pretty decent size. It's long and thin. It has generally the shape and size of a morning dove with a really long, narrow tail. And these birds uh, winter all the way south into um, Central America, South America. So they, uh, they're only here for a few months. And when they do arrive, it's usually uh, very inconspicuous that they're actually here. Um, what are they related to? They're, they're actually related to, um, they're in their own cuckoo family. Uh, Roadrunners are in the cuckoo family. So the roadrunners from the southwest are a type of cuckoo, and there are several more types of roadrunner or uh, cuckoo species in, uh, in South and Central America. But we have two around here. We have two that are very similar in appearance. They're called the black-billed cuckoo, and what this one was, the yellow-billed cuckoo. So the yellow-billed cuckoo is a, um, a rather uncommon summer bird in the Monadnock region and in, um, in areas in New Hampshire. But they're much more common as you go south into the mid-Atlantic states. Um, the black billed, however, gets more common as you go north. Um, so what, was there a question there that popped up? Yeah, would, would you be able to see them in Massachusetts? That was a question. So seeing them is not as easy as hearing them. Even though they're big and about a foot long and um, you know fairly sizable, they're, uh, they're really good at hiding. They're, uh, they're some of the ventriloquists of the bird world. And they only seem to appear in this area when the, uh, when the caterpillars are emerging in big numbers. So these are big caterpillar eaters. And uh, the cuckoos in particular are really special because they specialize in the hairy types of caterpillars that you see around. Most birds can't eat those. Most wildlife can't digest the hairs because they irritate the stomach. Cuckoos have a really interesting adaptation, though, in that they, when they build up enough hairs from these hairy caterpillars, they will shed their entire stomach lining all at once. Wow. So pretty, pretty strange adaptation for a bird, but. No, I'm just, the, the scat person in me is curious. When they shed their stomach lining, does it come out as part of their scat? I'm curious too. I've never seen it and I haven't really read about uh, how it's been described, but, um, but cuckoo stomachs have been studied and they've, they've looked at, um, scientists have studied just how many caterpillars can be in a cuckoo's stomach at one time. And some have found several hundred cuckoos or, or caterpillars, the small hairy type. So 
that's a lot of irritants, but they seem to emerge when the caterpillars come out. And these, these birds are really quiet in May and June, but the, the 4th of July comes around and the cuckoos start calling. So around here, it's been yellow builds mostly. And in Northern New Hampshire, it's been black build lately. So really fascinating species. And if I see one a year, it's, it's a good year. So they're that hard to see, but they're around us. If you wanted to hear cuckoo, is, is evening, is twilight and dusk the best time or are they going to be calling all throughout? Not, not as much, not as, uh, not as tied to those windows as other birds are. So uh, probably morning is best in general for, for that species, but um, just any time of the day. It could be the heat of the middle, middle of July. Um, I've heard a couple of this year around here. So keep an ear out, those in the, the Monadnock region, especially for the yellow-billed cuckoo. That was so fascinating. Wow. I can't even believe it. Every time Ask a Naturalist happens, I learn something new, at least one thing. I'm sure much more than that. Let's see what our next question is. Thanks, Bill. Why is this turtle rusty? Look at it. It definitely looks brown. Brett, what's up with this turtle? So I have a thought on this. I don't know 100%. Phil may also have thoughts on this, but my thought on this is that this turtle was hanging out in some water or muck that had iron deposits. And so it's just kind of got stained from the iron um, in the water or the mud where it was hanging out. And that if it goes into different water, eventually that'll clear off and it'll look more like we normally, um, like snapping turtles usually look. Um, that's just, a, that's an educated guess. So I don't know if Phil or anyone else has anything to add about that, but that's. that's yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that assessment. And um, I'll add that snapping turtles seem to be the most pollution tolerant of the turtles in our area. And you could find them in, in a lot of stagnant, mucky looking water. So not uncommon for them to have a little bit of staining from the environment around them. Oh, great. Thank you, guys. And let's just see that what a um, normal or unrusty one looks like. So that's the typical coloration. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thanks, Phil. Let's see what we got going on. Oh, here's another turtle question. This picture is so sweet. A painted turtle laid her eggs in my yard and when will they hatch? So this is from Francie and, it, and maybe they laid them around June. So she's curious, when should she look for them? Brett, how many uh do you so this is a, it depends. Um, so turtle, painted turtles, two to three months, 10 to 12 weeks on average for their eggs to hatch. But in our area, some, so that would put, if, if they were laid on June 11th, then that would put us into September, sometime in September. But in our area, sometimes both painted turtles and snapping turtles overwinter in the nest and hatch out the following spring. So my understanding is that this tends to happen more with the nests that are laid a little later in the season. So the June one could hatch in September, but she also, they may just stay in there until next April, until a really warm, um, warm day. I tend to notice them um, after kind of warm rains, them, or even on the same nights that the salamanders are out. Sometimes I see the baby turtles out in, in the spring, the hatchlings too. So could be September, could be early October, could be April or early May. So Francie will have to keep paying attention um, and notice, and maybe she can let us know. Um, and when, she, when they hatch, that would be great. Then we'll have some, some more information. And I will add one more thing, which is, I'm assuming that this hasn't happened to her eggs because she would have noticed it, I think. But the vast majority of turtle nests are predated um, right by raccoon, predated primarily by raccoons within the first few days that the eggs are laid. And so she would know if this had happened because there would be a hole, an excavation where the raccoon had dug and there'd be little shriveled up pieces of turtle eggshells all around. Um, so a lot of, like something like 90% of turtle nests get predated in those first few days. Another vulnerable time is right before they hatch. And some of the research on that says that that the, the predation that happens right after the eggs are laid tends to be raccoons. Later on, right before they're about to hatch, foxes. Um, so those are the two most vulnerable time for turtle eggs. So she would know if they had already been eaten because she'd see the eggshells in her yard. Um, and if hopefully they will, um, they'll make it to hatching um, 
but a lot of a lot of turtle nests don't and that's why it's so important these turtles are very long-lived species it's so important that they um, can continue to return year after year to lay eggs um, that's why roads are so dangerous for them because in the spring the vast majority of turtles on roads are females looking for nesting sites and when they get hit um, it removes an adult breeding female from the population and that can have a really big impact because they really need to live a long time in order to successfully reproduce and um, sustain their populations. So hey, Brett, there were a lot going on in a, in a turtle nest. There were a couple of additional questions. Um, one person was curious, how long do turtles live for? Because you did mention they're long lived. So do you have estimates about snappings and painted turtles? I've read that snapping turtles can, can live upwards of 60 or 70 years, maybe even more than 100 years. Um, I know that there was a wood turtle study in Swansea. There was a farmer who as a kid, um, I don't recommend this. You actually definitely should not do this for wood turtles. But as a kid, like in the 50s, he, he notched the year on the wood turtle shelf. And um, uh, a friend I knew who was a graduate student at Antioch in the mid, late 2000s found some of those same turtles when he was doing a telemetry study of wood turtles at that site. So they can be quite long lived. I can't remember for painteds um, how long, but they, most of them don't even reach um, reproductive maturity until somewhere between 12 and 25 years old. Wow. So, Oh, and one last question is, um, people are wondering if adult turtles, if they make it to adulthood, what animals prey on them? Mostly just humans. Um, they don't, as adults, they don't have a lot of predators, but there are people who hunt snapping turtles, um, who eat them, and of course cars, but they're pretty well protected in their shells. And um, it's, their, it's, it's as youngins that they're vulnerable. The little ones can be gulped down by herons, um, Foxes, I'm sure. And anything that eats little animals will eat a little turtle. Um, but once they get big, they're, they're, they don't have too many predators. Great. Thank you so much. That was so much great turtle information. And it really makes you think about turtles and their longevity. And thank you. That was great. Let's see what our next question is. Is this a poll question? Okay. What kind of tree and how tall? So here's the video. And then we're going to have a poll for you to see if you can figure it out. Miles is pointing out the um, the trunk is gray. This is some close up shots of it. It's, so it's the gray trunk. And here are the choices, white pine, white ash, white oak, American beech, or other. We have one person who voted. <laughs> People are really looking at it, thinking about it. Got a clear, it looks like we are, ooh. We have close, white ash, looks like it's right up in front, Amer followed by American beach. And then the third choice was white oak. So we're gonna ask Jeremy, Jeremy, as, as the tree guy here, what do you got to say about this? Uh, I'd say it's remarkable that, I guess we have these still pictures with the, with the leaves on top, but it's remarkable that people, that many people guess white ash. I saw this video originally and I had no idea just because it was too far away to really distinguish the leaves and then the, there's no way to pick up the trunk pattern. And then even when we got a picture of the trunk pattern, which is in the lower left hand corner there. That looks more like red maple or sugar maple to me than it does white ash. And Phil, come on in if you have anything to say, but the leaves are certainly white ash leaves. Um, so anyway, it's kind of mysterious, the bark. White ash typically has a very, um, the, the ridges form a diamond shaped pattern that's very distinctive in, in the bark, except when it gets very old. Um, then it starts to break down a little bit. I have to admit by being fooled by the photos on the right because the bark looked so pale that, uh, that it jumped out as maybe a American beach. Right, the, the bark looks looks like it's beach but, or, or on the right. But then if you look at the, the bark on the lower left, 
I don't know. That could be red maple or sugar maple, but it doesn't. It doesn't look like ash, but the leaves are definitely ash. So. Wow. And so the question also was about how tall it is, and I don't know if you can estimate that. That's really hard to do. Um, I mean, you can do it easily if you have some some simple tools. So you need a, a a tape so that you can tell how far you are from the base of the tree, and then you. You need something called a clinometer or anything that angles that measures a, an angle and you, you you measure that angle to the top of the tree and you basically set up a right triangle and you can do a simple trigono trigonometric function to calculate height based on that. Um, but how tall is this ash? Ash get pretty tall for our for our northern hardwoods. Um, I don't I don't know how big it is in diameter. There's just there's nothing to relate it to. So it's very difficult. But you might find an ash, a tall ash that's sort of emerging above the canopy that's, that's, uh, you know, up to 90 feet, maybe, maybe even 100 feet. But again, I, I, I don't know how big this tree is relative to, um, it's just so hard to tell without something in the picture frame to, to, to give a, a reference. Phil, do you have any ideas? I mean, I've, cert I've certainly seen ash at, at 90 feet, but that's about as tall as as we see them in this region. Bill, you get any, you want to add anything? Um, well, it, it brings to mind an old growth stand of hardwood trees not too far away from the Harris Center that I believe I once saw with Mead Caddo uh, in Stoddard. So there are some old growth ash trees. Um, there's one that, um, one growth that's on an Audubon sanctuary that used to support nesting great blue herons, which is a strange location. Uh, not in a beaver swamp location, but just in big dead or dying ash trees uh, that were old growth. That's really cool. Well, I have to end by saying that's a big ash. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Luckily, people can't throw things at me. Whew, one other good thing about Zoom. All right, let's see what's next. Whose nest would this be? The glasses are so you can see it better. Uh -huh. No, wait, just kidding. They're help you. They're to help you with the size. So this is this is a little nest. Phil, whose little nest is this, and and how to get on the ground, maybe? Well, nests are pretty hard to tell typically in the songbird worlds because they're all so small. There's so many different types of songbirds around, but there are a couple of key characteristics here that jump out to me, and um, and the the chief one here is. Um, the presence of white birch strips, uh, peeled peeled white birch, uh, in the photo. So, uh, um, so yeah, this nest is small, smaller than a set of glasses, a couple of inches in diameter maybe, and um, lots of white birch. Um, and if you looked closely, there'd probably also be some grapevine bark, and that's another characteristic of the red-eyed vireo. Um, the red-eyed vireo is one of the most common songbirds in in all of the northeast um, their populations estimated to be about 200 million in the u.s and canada so really numerous songbird they're singing all summer long around where we are and i happen to have two vireo nests with me here because they're just so easy to find um so i could show you just how tiny these are here uh, you know next to my finger so a couple inches in diameter um, so same idea, they both have white birch bark. Some will also use yellow birch bark, which is a little more of a golden color. Um, but if you do look really closely, the kind of the brownish that you can see here is that grape, uh, grape bark. And, you know, grape is a vine that's present native in our area. And it's used uh, for the structure, especially because it's very flexible and it helps um, it helps hold the nest cup together. So they have these perfect little cups. They're easy to find in the winter. So we always go out and grab a couple for the collection um, because they won't reuse the same nests. That's Do great. they strip the bark off? Oh, um, I see a bunch of questions, but yeah. go ahead, Susie. Well, you... I was just going to say somebody asked if we had the call and I just put, I looked it up on um, the Cornell site. So I'm going to play it, see if you can hear it. Can you hear it? Um, 
I'm not hearing the Vireo. Yeah. White-eyed Vireo. Maybe you want to... Oh, sorry. Red-eyed. Red red-eyed. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> red-eyed Vireo. <laughs> it's, okay. I'll look it up. Maybe you can answer the other ones and I'll get it loaded up. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. The other questions were, do they, do they peel the bark? I believe they do. Um, they also will harvest uh, another interesting material, and my nest here shows it. They use a paper wasp and bald-faced hornet nesting material in their nest. So it's uh, it's another really strange adaptation of the bird world. And why does anybody think they might use hornet nest as part of their outer decoration? Is there any functional reason for that? Any guesses? I should have a pole. Waterproof? Yeah. It's just yeah. left over from when they eat the hornet larvae. And ah, they're, well, and they're eating the, do they eat the, do they eat? Do that. Yeah, so we, had, we had that question a couple months ago, right? About, um, oh yeah, paper about, wasp that's nest. right. Cause we had, I, I had something this. eating our paper wasp nest, which I later, I think it was a blue jay actually. I looked it up after our, after asking naturalists and found out that blue jays do right. occasionally, but I didn't see anything about Vireos, so. Could it be to scare away other birds? That seems to be somebody's response. Well, Cryptic, kind of like, oh, we're actually a wasp nest, not a nest. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the, the theory out there, I think, as to why they use it. It might help deter other birds because um, not a lot of, or, or predators as well, but not a lot of um, other bird species will nest anywhere close to a bald-faced hornet nest, which can be these big, you know, foot long or more uh, very dangerous structures if you get too close to them. The hornets will go after uh, birds as well and they have a nasty sting. So um, so it could be, you know, you know, a way of trying to uh, to keep predators away. However, it doesn't always work. They, uh, they get found pretty easily. Um, Brown-headed cowbirds in particular are a nest parasite that deposit their eggs in other nests. So cowbird, um, cowbirds young are raised by another species. So the red-eyed vireo, unfortunately, is a victim to the cowbirds more often than many other bird species are. But they seem to find ways to deal with it just by the, the numbers that they have um, achieved today. Very interesting. It's and quite I common. I did get the red-eyed vireo, not the white-eyed vireo. Let's try this again. Here's the call. I always love this call. Got it, huh? That's it. Yep. Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. Where are you? They sing in these little phrases. And they'll sing in the heat of the day and all day long throughout the summer when many birds are not singing at this time of the year you'll still hear these guys. All right, that was great. Thank you, Phil, so much great information. And thanks to Jim for that great photograph with the glasses for scale. That really helps everybody when you put in the scale, whether it's a nest or scat or a, a print. All right, let's see what our next question is. What is eating the petals off the daisies in my yard? Oh my goodness, Jenna. Why do I, why am I thinking this might be a bug? Well, you know, it probably is because if it was a mammal, they'd probably want the protein packed center with all the pollen. Um, so I've been doing research and looking in my own garden and other people's gardens. And I've seen several things. One, during the daytime, I saw Japanese beetles eating petals off of cone flowers lately. And this is when the Japanese beetles are around a lot. So it could be that. Um, if this person is not seeing the insect in the daytime being active, then there's a couple different options at night. So earwigs are apparently a big one that like to eat the petals off of um, flowers at night. And another one is some different types of beetle larvae that live in the soil at, in the daytime and then crawl out at night to feed on, for some reason, petals. So I don't know what the attraction of the petals is, but um, outside in my yard right now, I have a, a ton of different types of flowers with this, you know, central pollen and nectar core, and then all these petals, and most of them have been eaten. So I don't know if it's just a bad year for this, but um, it is, I'm guessing it's an insect. We just don't know which one. 
Um, but those are the options that I came up with. Good job. That was good. Um, yeah. I want to add one thing because this, these are my photos. And after I took them, I started kind of um, looking at the Caterpillar Labs Facebook um, posts because they have so, I, I wondered if it might also be an insect. And um, uh, Sam Jaffe was out there looking at a different kind of daisy and had some sort of looper caterpillars that were eating the, what I think what he called oxide daisies with the tiny little petals, which um, made, which I, I think turned into moths. Jenna would know more than me about that, but I wondered if that might also, but I never really saw the caterpillars doing this. I didn't see it happen. So I think it was probably happening at night, Jenna, like you said. I can speak from some personal experience with earwigs. Um, when I lived at a place where the earwigs would eat our lettuce and I'd have to get up in the middle of the night and kill them. Um, and it was not that fun, but um, the earwigs definitely were eating a lot of the foliage and then they'd also eat the flowers on some of the um, vegetables that we were growing. So I'm, I'm voting the earwigs for this one. Good job. All right, let's see what we got. What do we have next? Oh boy. Last summer, we identified the source of pieces of grass which seem to accumulate more in the volume each summer in our windows. This year, the grass carrying wasps have nested in just about every window frame of our home on Hurricane Road in Keene. We are about one mile from Westmoreland Line. We have watched them carrying grass into the tiny corners of our windows, watched the development of the larva, and even recently provided a bee house to encourage nesting elsewhere. We would like information on how we might encourage nesting in other areas of our property. Presently, we owe we, opening, we are opening specific windows to allow for development of the larva in other windows as we understand they are pollinators. At this time, I haven't taken a video of them entering the windows with grass or larva. Jenna, you're in high demand tonight. I know. So this is, my, bugs. this is my favorite thing. Like this is just the coolest thing. So these grass carrying wasps, I would love to see this. I mean, I don't really want them nesting in every window that I have, but they really do individually take pieces of grass. Um, these wasps like to nest above ground. They're a solitary wasp. And a, most solitary wasps that I'm familiar with like to nest below ground. But this is one of the ones that likes to nest above ground. So if we didn't have windows for them to nest in, they like to nest in hollow stems of plants. And they also like to nest in wood, like you know, some kind of a log in the forest that has a hole. They don't create the hole. They just bring the, the grass to it. So they're not destructive at all. Um, and the reason that we're seeing all of these grasshoppers is that that is their primary food source. So they're gonna, well, not, not for the adult, but for the larva. So the adult will create this nest out of grass. That's her first step. And then her second step is to provision it with um, all of these little grasshoppers or crickets, depending on what she can find. And then her third step will be to lay the eggs. And each one, each egg has its own little compartment. You can't really tell in this picture, but they're little compartments for each. And so if it's a long sort of area, whether it's in a plant stem or a window, they'll have multiple larvae they are, that are developing. And the female will bring them snacks. So this is what they're going to eat as they grow. And the adult doesn't eat these. The adult is a pollinator, just like Debbie mentioned. So the adult is going to be a really good thing for your garden. Um, and additionally, what's really cool is that these do not sting anything but the prey that they are bringing to the window. Yeah, there you go. So these won't sting. They don't have the ability to sting a human. Um, and they'll just develop and eat and just keep munching away. What's interesting, really surprised me when I was researching the development is it only takes about a week to a week and a half for the larvae to develop. So from egg to pupa is not very long and it's faster in warm weather like we're having. So then it'll turn into a pupa and it could develop into an adult this same summer in our climate or it could overwinter. Sort of reminded me of what Brett was saying about the turtle. Like it might hatch this year or it might hatch next year. So it was kind of the same idea. So Jenna, a part yeah. of the question was, um, 
maybe people don't want them in their every window of their house. No, they probably don't. That's okay, but like every window. So do you have any suggestions, anything that they could? Well, I, you know, I thought about this and I think the best thing really is just to plug up the little ways that they're getting in, like before they do it, because once they're there, I don't know how you change the pattern, but I'm guessing that they've, you know, it's one of these things where they, um, I have these carpenter bees that I know it's a different carpenter bee every year, but they always nest in the same place in my garage. So I'm wondering if there's some type of, I hatched from here, I'm going to go back here with my nesting material next year. So unless you plug up every little way for them to get in, um, they're probably going to, they just like it. Um, and so the Debbie did put a bee house out, which is perfect. So those are, you can buy them at Agway, you can make your own. Um, I also read that one thing you can do is take um, hollowed out bamboo or Japanese knotweed that's old and they like to be horizontal in their nest. So if you can put anything, a horizontal bundle of like bamboo stakes that are all hollow and bundle them together with twine and just lay them out there somewhere, they like that size. They like it to be about 10 inches long. And I think most of the bee houses I've seen are not long enough. I think they would need a longer area. Um, they also really, really like to pollinate. Well, the flowers that they like to go to for nectar are white and yellow typically. So if, if you have a lot of white and yellow flowers and you don't want them to come back next year, maybe replant with something else. But I think the best bet really is to plug up the little holes in the windows. Apparently this is like a major problem because when I was looking up these grass carrying wasps and where they nest over and over again, it was like between the storm window and the regular and you know what I mean like it was just a, a problem all around all over the country wow and, yeah. wow so fascinating the bug yeah. world it's just always so fascinating thank you Jenna especially for all of your research into this and the good advice that you gave and wow holy mackerel glad I'm not a grasshopper <laughs> all right let's see we have I think we have two more questions okay what's eating my tree and pooping on my patio and this is a very timely question because just this week you might be outside and and sitting like I was on my patio and I hear it sounds like rain but it's not raining it's like coming down and then I looked in my beer which I was drinking in a mug and there was some frass in my beer and I realized that what I was hearing wasn't rain. It wasn't caterpillars chewing. It was actually poop falling. And um, I don't know. I'm going to pass this question to both Jeremy and Jenna because I think this, this is an overlap of where forestry and entomology kind of interact. So what's causing all of this? Poop beer, yeah. So uh, this insect up here um is i can you point to it miles in case it's blending in for people so that insect is the saddled prominent caterpillar it gets the name because in its next stage which is a, a larger caterpillar it has a red marking on its back that is looks a bit like a saddle um and this is a defoliator of mostly sugar maple that's its favorite thing but it also will move to things like oak and I think it likes beach as well. And we are in an outbreak year with this insect. This is an insect that goes through a, um, a cyclical outbreak and it used to be predictable for a little while. So this was like, it was like six to eight years, it would have an outbreak. And you'd see a ton of them one year and you'd be rained on by frass. And then the next year there were hardly any and you wouldn't even see them, no frass raining in your beer. So um, this year, it's crazy. So I actually didn't even know about this until Monday when Miles told me there's this insect called the saddle prominent. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. So here's a fun fact. I, I told Jeremy this already, that when I was in graduate school over 20 years ago, I studied the saddle prominent. And we were waiting. It was supposed to be an outbreak year. It was like we were the first year of my research. We got all ready with our population monitoring and we were ready to go the second year we were going to have this huge population we're going to be rained on with frats and we were going to get really good data well guess what it didn't happen it didn't happen so like the data the second year was just useless so it's happening now i missed my window well it's not too late jenna you can do all your studying <laughs> for this you can so, just oh by the way project. this caterpillar 
turns into a very boring looking brown moth. So, okay. And Jeremy, is there anything you want to add about um, this caterpillar and its impact on forests? Muted. It is not. Hey, Jeremy, you're muted. Jeremy, we can't hear you. You're muted. There you go. Not go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I kept pushing the button and it went too often. I was, I was running in the woods yesterday in Dublin and you start looking around and there are green oak leaves everywhere on the forest floor. And so this, and I've heard from Steve Robert, who's a, 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 a extension forester in the state that this is quite a large outbreak this year, uh, certainly around the Monadnock region, but even beyond that. And it's, uh, it's really, we're not sort of, we're in the midst of it and it's gonna get worse in terms of, if you start looking up at the canopy, we're gonna see some very light canopies relatively soon because these are, are incredibly voracious insects in, in, the, in their eating. In fact, the, in this oak forest I was in yesterday, you already could look up and it doesn't look normal for a July forest. It looks more like, I don't know, something in late September or something like that, but not, not the right colors yet. Uh, so be prepared. We're gonna really feel the impacts of this uh, insect over the year. Because it's a, a sort of late season defoliator, it doesn't tend to have a huge impact if it's in, if, if trees get defoliated one year, but sometimes there's multiple defoliations and it really starts to have an impact. And also because it defoliates, or if the defoliation is extreme, that is to say almost every leaf is gone from the tree, uh, sometimes trees will try to, to reflush, send out new leaves and that's, it, it's very hard on a tree because they put a lot of energy into that. And it also leads to bud set that doesn't happen appropriately. So there can, there can be some real damage to branches associated with that. Wow. I mean, does this surprise anybody in the year of 2020 that not only would we have a pandemic, but now we have a caterpillar invasion? I mean, I don't want to, I'm afraid to ask what's next, but I just did. So well, anyone in this region should look for these, these little frass pellets. They're everywhere, anywhere you have a surface where you can see them and start looking up at the canopy and we're gonna notice that it will get lighter and lighter as, as the, the, the later instars of this caterpillar really start to eat these leaves. There was some good advice. If you do look up, make sure you keep your mouth closed. Will help us affect the uh, mast. So will it affect the mast is a question. Well, if one thing I, I don't know about, I'm guessing yes, but one thing I do know is that it affects the sap and the sugar maple the next year. So um, when I was doing my research, I was doing it entirely in maple sugar bushes because that is where the growers wanted to know, you know, what was gonna be happening year to year because it is a late season defoliator. If they do try to reflush, then the sap quality is gonna be really low the next year. And so that's gonna affect the maple sugar producers. So. Wow, good, well, not good job, good news, but bad news, good job. I think this is our last slide coming up. We have a video, so let's see what Miles has. I have Susie, a Bob. Susie, wait a minute, Ruth Benedict's asking, should we cut off nests? The nests you're seeing are not this insect. The nests you're seeing are uh, fall webworms, which look a lot like tent caterpillars. Um, be, again, because tent caterpillars, you can cut off the nests and, and reduce an infestation. But for fall webworms, because it's late in the season, it really doesn't have a huge impact on the tree. So they're really ugly and unsightly, but they're not something you need to cut off. Good job. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, I have a bobcat down in Kingston. I have been watching for over 20 years. Do bobcats put two litters together like foxes do sometimes? What is the largest amount of kittens out of a den in one litter? The reason I ask is this year's litter has four kittens. I've never seen one, four in one litter. I was surprised when we saw three in the litter a few years ago, but four is unheard of, Robbie. Before um, we show the video, I just want to address one thing about um, the two litters together like foxes do. That is um, not something foxes typically do at all. Um, they're actually very territorial and they don't combine litters. Um, and sometimes the only thing a fox that might happen with a fox is the young female from a litter before will, will be with the um, 
the mother box and help raise the litter, but they don't typically, they don't put two litters together. So let's watch the video. And then I have Eric Aldrich, who's been studying bobcats through his wildlife cam for um, many years now. And he's gonna give us some answers. And this is a really cool video. Actually, I think Eric had to uh, step out. Oh, no. Okay, good thing I'm prepared. I did a little research. So Miles, you wanna show us the video? To watch the video, there's the two um, kits that come forward and then off to the side where Miles pointer is, you can see one, one little kit come and climb the tree and then here comes the fourth one. This is just an incredible video of bobcats. I love it and I'm really grateful for Robbie for sending it in and it's a treat for all of us to get a glimpse of um, of bobcats like this. And I guess what I would have to say is um, I did do some research into this and bobcats typically have a litter between the numbers of two and four, sometimes even six. Um, so four, yes, that is unusual. The typical number is typically two. When I did talk with Eric, he said that um, they, they have been able to videotape um, or capture on their wildlife cam uh, typical litters of two and occasionally um, a few litters with three, but he's never found in this area a litter of four. So this is in Kingston. It's good to remember that we had a really great mast year in the fall. Last fall, there was tons of acorns and we have a big boom in small rodents. Have everybody been noticing the additional chipmunks in their gardens? Right, so this has been really good for predators like the bobcat who need that really good food to support a litter of four. And they needed it in the fall. They needed a mast and food in the fall so that when they went into um, the mating season, um, they could have enough fat in their body to be able to support um, having this number of kits. So um, even though it is unusual and un kind of like, whoa, blows your mind away for kids, um, it does happen. So that's what I have to say is I'm sad that Eric couldn't be here because he's really the guy who's done the research. But you could come tomorrow night, um, come and join us from 5.30 to 6.30 and hear what Rory Carroll has to say about the number of young that bobcats have and their dispersal, which is also pretty interesting. So thank you. It's been a, an incredible Ask a Naturalist night, so full of amazing information. I want to say thank you to all of you who uh, participated and participated in our polls and sent us questions and showed up tonight. We're so grateful to all of you. And a special thanks to all the experts out there, um, Brett and Jenna and Jeremy and Phil um, and Miles for managing all of the technical pieces. Um, thank you guys. Tonight has been great and have a great evening. Hope to see a lot of you back here for Bobcats tomorrow night. And Ask a Naturalist in August. Send us your questions. Ciao.